All right. Well, welcome everyone to uh, focus on number 13. Uh, today we have a pretty excited crowd, it looks like, to catch up with Centrifuge for their third quarter update. Uh, today we're joined by uh, a couple smiling faces from the Centrifuge team. Uh, we have Lucas, Colin, Kevin, and Asad uh, here to, uh, like I said, check in with uh, what their project has going on and also touch on a little bit of uh, the, the topic of the day with uh, Endgame to uh, talk a little bit about how they uh, see the evolution of the DAO going. Uh, as a quick reminder, as anyone has questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, uh, also invite you to come on stage, but if it's a, a popular topic, we may have to limit that a little bit, but uh, definitely happy to answer all the questions. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, grab a hand the mic over to Assad to uh, introduce the uh, topic of the day and uh, take it away. Thank you, Retro. Thank you, SES, for uh, hosting us for, uh, for Lucky Number 13. Uh, my name is Assad Khan. For those who don't know me, I do protocol partnerships here at Centrifuge. And um, nothing seems like a more exciting topic than real world assets in DeFi these days, especially in Maker. So um, I've got a couple friends up here, and we're going to kind of share basically what we've been working on at Centrifuge, talk a little bit about our history with Maker, and also share our perspective on some things. Uh, I have this nice little disclaimer here, which means you can't sue me. So um, good luck. Uh, but basically, nothing should be taken as financial advice, and I don't think we're going to speak on anything that uh, would be otherwise. Uh, just for the table of contents real quick, just to cover this, um, you know, Lucas will present on the, the Maker Centrifuge Partnership, kind of just talk about what our vision is and our fundamental beliefs. We, you know, we spent a lot of time over the last few years building towards something in, in real world assets in DeFi. I think it's really useful to just provide that perspective again. Uh, we'll share it over to Colin to share about our platform, kind of what we've done so far, where we think we're going, like what the future looks like, and just some more fundamental protocol perspective. And then I've invited Kevin Chan from Block Tower, who's a partner of ours, to speak about our view of MetaDAOs. We've been spending a lot of time since the endgame discussions have first started, building our perspective, trying to really just take this idea seriously. And um, I think it'd be useful to share our perspective, invite you know, some feedback, and hopefully have some good questions in the, in the Q&A. Uh, really would encourage people to drop some questions in, all the things you want to know about real-world assets. There's certainly a, a topic we're discussing today, so feel free to drop those in. Uh, looking forward to that. Without further ado, I'll invite Lucas to take it away. Cool. Yeah. Um, maybe just quick intro for myself. I'm co-founder and, and CEO at Centrifuge. Um, my personal story with MakerDAO goes all the way back to 2017, and it was probably one of the first really like crypto projects besides Ethereum and Bitcoin that I I dove really deep on, um, but but kind of like just to set the stage, like I'm, I'm right, like I think I'm I'm preaching to the choir here, and I'm, I'm kind of like repeating something that we've all that we've that people in crypto have been repeating for so many times, right? But like the reason why we're here, and why a lot of people are here, I think the reason why probably the whoever it was that that wrote the white paper, the Bitcoin white paper, wrote it was a very clear nod to the fact that our financial system isn't really um, solving the problems we need to be solved, right? Um, and and uh, many years later now, um, I think, right, we have kind of this idea of decentralized finance as actually an alternative to the financial system that we have today. And and it is trying to fix what I think is a very, very broken system. And, and like just one kind of like very honestly mind-boggling number and, and kind of like good illustration that I always use is well like if you have a borrower Bob the borrower and and Lisa the lender right like Bob the borrower pays interest um, but usually um, say like for for a college loan mortgage car loan business loan whatever um, and then you somewhere on the other side you have Lisa the lender like me having money on my bank account that my bank is lending out to another borrower or like Right, like um, I put it into some sort of savings fund, right? Like the the reality is, as as a as a lender, I have I, I receive almost no, none of this money, right? And why? Because kind of like this legacy financial system that we've built over the last hundred years, it's kind of like gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and kind of as bureaucracy does, right? It, it just find you find a way to kind of like increase their own fees, increase their own. Uh, their own upside as opposed to like trying to build a more efficient product. 
And and just like one one very number number that I want to mention here is like the financial industry is estimated to be somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of global GDP. Um, right. Like what that means is if I if you think of like you're buying you're buying a loaf of bread for a couple of dollars, like 20 20 percent of that isn't going to the baker, but it's going to the bank, the credit card merchants, the uh, bank that finances the house, right? Like everything around everything around um, this whole like financial industry. So really think about it. For every dollar you spend, um, there's probably like like dozens of financial intermediaries that are taking up almost 20, 20 cents of that dollar. Really for what? For like moving money from A to B, which like by now is really pretty much a solved problem, I would say. We have PayPal, credit cards, bank transfers, and now of course we have crypto. Um, and, and then, well, the other thing is maybe they're allocating capital, managing risk and doing all these things. And that's, I think we're like, right, we're experimenting a lot with DeFi and saying, well, actually we can probably find a way that, um, we can do this much more efficiently, right? Where we don't have to pay the 20 cents of the banks. And that's really, I think, why, why we're all here, right? Um, and that's, that's, and ultimately Maker, Center Future, we're both trying to solve that or, or improve the situation and build financial products for people to use. And, and I think real world assets are, are an important part of, of like that because, well, like not everyone's lucky enough to have crypto collateral, but, um, a lot of people just want to use their house or their uh, business revenue as a way to access finance, right? Um, there's other reasons why we think that's super important, um, specifically for Maker, right? Like volatility always has been a big risk, systemic risk for Maker. The fact is today, um, besides USDC, which is a different problem, but almost all crypto assets are heavily correlated, much more correlated than most other asset classes in the world. Um, such as like equity, real estate, right? So like you have um, kind of this, and we remember from like Black Thursday, um, this problem that maker can only really be a safe um, or, or die can only really be a safe kind of like stable, uh, stable currency if we have many different uncorrelated asset classes um, backing it. And so maybe just like a few graphs, right? Like it's, it's as crazy as May to November 21, like DeFi went up in DeFi TVL went up 83%. Um, and and kind of like Sunny Future grew quite crazy as well. But but in the end, I think that's that's not the, the interesting number. But what the interesting number was that like when T DeFi TVL then in the crash, like collapsed by 70%, right? And that means like like all the like crazy cyclical, right? Um, crazy um, leveraged, which ultimately puts a lot of stress also on the system. And so as a collateral base, it's good to have some of, some of this very liquid, very speculative assets in, in Maker, but not all. Um, and, and so that's that's like one, one big reason, right? But I actually think, to come back to like why we're building DeFi, why we're building Maker, actually I think an equally important um, problem besides solving the supply side of, May, of, of DAI, meaning we need to replace not just the volatile crypto, or not just amend the volatile crypto collateral, but also replace USDC in in backing die with other assets that generate a return that are not don't expose a single counterparty risk that Circle has. Right. Um, what we also want is we want to actually make sure there's plenty of users that use DeFi. And so, Sunny Future in many ways has taken the hard route in in a lot of places where um, we we um go we, we like make, we want to not just build some product that takes money out of maker and puts it into the real world but we actually want to bring like debt as a thing on chain right because why because well all these benefits all these like ideas of what the future in, of DeFi could look like right like they don't happen if we just give die to some like bank that then like distributes it to their to their to the user to customers no like you actually need to take the bank and put it on chain right and that's what what we're what we're doing um with centrifuge and that ultimately grows not just the supply of die but it also grows the demand right because now more and more users can actually instead of 
just using their traditional banking system, maybe they'll be able to start borrowing and die. Maybe they'll start be able to start pay and they'll be able to buy die and then earn an interest because they can lend it out to someone that will invest it in real estate or to a, a centrifuge pool that will uh, invest in in uh, consumer loans, right? That's kind of like the other aspect of, of why we think kind of on-chain securitization is an extremely important aspect of, of kind of like a real world asset strategy. Um, so this is like our big motivation and I'll keep it very high level because I don't have too much time to go into depth, but kind of like to, to, to give a bit of context, um, right? Like this is probably one of probably the 20th time I'm speaking on a maker community governance collateral onboarding call or whatever. Um, and we've had a very, very long history, right, of working on that together. I said it's probably been in the beginning of, of Bitcoin was the beginning of trying to figure out how we improve the financial system. And equally for us, um, the beginning of MakerDAO and the beginning of Centrifuge is similarly, okay, like how do we, um, how do we actually improve the financial system and, and allow people to borrow and lend? And our history goes all the way back to like, I think 2019 uh, in April, uh, we started experimenting with what we called Tin Lake at the time as a first prototype, um, and it grew into what it is today, which is kind of like the first structured uh, product in DeFi that is used to back the first real world assets in Maker um, that was scaled to 90 million in DAI um, and in in uh, in basically loans. And now, of course, we're we're kind of like working on the next. Um, on the next steps, which are scaling this with arrangers, with the metadata, and with uh, with the trust structure. And I think, right? So, so kind of like to keep to to set maybe a bit of a goalpost. What we want to do is we want to get to not just a few hundred million in DAI from real world assets, but we want to show TradFi that we can actually grow this to a billion, right? And I think that's a very important symbolic number for us, but also a symbolic number for Maker because a billion dollars in, in real world assets in Maker means, hey, this is like an asset class that like people in finance will start looking at and say, okay, this is like an, an alternative. And at the same time, right? Like I can tell you a billion in TVL of real world assets is absolutely nothing um, because most of these asset classes we're talking about here, real estate, consumer loans, credit card debt, car loans, commercial paper, those markets are trillions in dollars, right? Not billions. Um, and so as a way, kind of like, yes, we're, we're probably, uh, we're, we're still 10X off of where we are today, but uh, we're, we're thousands and thousands of times uh, off of, of where we will be kind of as we, we make DeFi mainstream, right? Yeah, so I'll, I'll maybe hand it over to Colin to talk a bit more about what, what specifically we, we are doing today. Cool, thanks, Lucas. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the head of business development at Centrifuge, and I actually joined Centrifuge right on the heels uh, of the first uh, 1 million die being minted um, with New Silver. Uh, in April of uh, 2021, yeah. So uh, my story with make uh, my story with Centrifuge is has has very much uh, been a story of Maker as well. Um, so I'm excited to talk a little bit about uh, where we are and where we're going. Um, so where we are today, and going back to Lucas's reference to our history, um, at this moment, what I think where we kind of see it is that we've we've built the infrastructure. Um, we've worked really hard with the entire maker community and various core units um, to prove out the concept of real world assets. And that's led to that 90 million in TVL. Um, but we're at a transition moment uh, from proof of concept um, to what we really consider to be product market fit. Um, and so the, the infrastructure for on for on chain um, structuring of private debt through like real world assets, as we call it, um, that exists today, and you can see it here in front of you. Um, where we've, as we've focused on the technology, we've also focused on, um, with New Silver being the first pool, and then some subsequent pools around it, 
uh, continuing to prove out um, the idea of real world assets and continuing to improve uh, what the processes look like between uh, Maker on one side and Centrifuge on the other. Um, today, what you have is you have uh, Centrifuge as your infrastructure layer, right? Allowing you to tokenize, securitize, um, and then plug into through MIP22, Centrifuge pools can plug directly into Maker Vaults, uh, allowing for uh, real world assets to be financed with DAI. Um, through this journey over the past year and a half, and maybe about six to nine months ago, uh, it became very clear that we needed a better trust structure in place uh, to serve um, a DAO, uh, which hadn't really been considered uh, before. Um, that's why we developed the indentured trust uh, in that legal structure uh, in partnership with the real world finance core unit. So you can see the work that's done there. If you haven't, um, it's, it's on like everything else on the maker forum. Um, and that's been critical because of the nature of real world assets being natively off chain uh, as we bring them on chain in the form of uh, NFTs and real world assets, ensuring that there's some kind of legal recourse and legal structure uh, that serves um, a DAO or any on-chain lender uh, will be mission critical for scaling real world assets and delivering on the vision uh, that Centrifuge and Maker have uh, begun today. Um, I think the, the the final consideration for this slide is just as we think about the 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 pools that started our journey with New Silver being the first, and then you look to the future. Um, there are there are groups in front of MakerDAO now, um, like Block Tower and also like RFA Bank, um, that are institutional in nature. Um, and I know these are just some small sub subset of uh, the type of institutional grade quality that's coming to MakerDAO um, around a lot of other uh, different paths. So as we think about real world assets and where we are today, um, we think we're on a, a bit of a a bit of a pre precipice uh, of of what could be really big. Um, but we'll talk about that more in a, in a future slide. So uh, where we're going, um, and as we look at kind of the, the, the roadmap for Centrifuge, is we want to build an institutional grade protocol to support the entire world of credit uh, coming on chain. What I think this represents is probably a middle stage, um, is if the first stage was really proof of concept, I think we're now starting to work towards product market fit. And if proof of concept was really about infrastructure and technology, uh, this this product market fit piece is, uh, I would say, a bit more, uh, maybe a bit more complicated and more complex in the sense that we're now building um, the ecosystem around the infrastructure. Uh, I think the indenture trust is a good example of that, um, but even more so, um, some of the work that we're starting to do here um, around new processes, um, new governance, uh, and taking a lot of some of the best practices, at least on the centrifuge side that we've seen um, from the maker community, trying to adopt some of those um, to scale centrifuge and to make real world assets um, a, a, a very real and viable path um, for the continued uh, circulation uh, and growth of DAI. Uh, so one example of that is the, the POP process, which we call the pool onboarding proposal process. Uh, this is, uh, we're taking some of the best practices from um, the MIP6 process and some of the things that we've learned from Maker over the years um, to create a process where any issuer, anyone that wants to represent real world assets and uh, securitize those assets on chain through Centrifuge can actually uh, go through their own self-directed process uh, through the Centrifuge community um, and uh, uh, propose uh, to finance real world assets on chain. Um, another group uh, or another way that we think about this is the emergence of a credit group within the centrifuge ecosystem, um, which is a group of, of individuals that will begin to look at uh, and eventually underwrite um, potential uh, issuers that are company, coming through the centrifuge protocol. Uh, and then finally, some of the CFG utility, right, is uh, there are many CFG token holders um, and starting to think about proposals and ways uh, to enable and empower our community or holders of the CFG token to uh, be involved um, will also allow us uh, to scale the protocol uh, in a safe and, and really in a, a, a decentralized manner. Um, and so what that brings us to uh, is what we think is like uh, is a tipping point, right? Where, as Lucas alluded to, the, the world of 
of off-chain credit is massive and, and we're not even scratching the surface. And so the way we see it is that the world of on-chain credit really uh, encompasses uh, the ecosystems, communities, and protocols uh, that allow that, that on-chain world to exist. Uh, and at the foundation of on-chain credit uh, has been Centrifuge and has been Maker for the past three years. Um, and so as we look to the future and we think about moving from proof of concept to product market fit um, and through to scale, uh, some of the things that are going to be critical here uh, are decentralized governance and processes, which we're working at Centrifuge, um, the ability to bring on institutional grade issuers who have the ability to really scale um, and um, bring real world assets in, in a way that the uh, the on-chain lenders can be excited about and finance, um, and then working together to just bring the entire world of, of, of credit on-chain. And so uh, for us, we feel like we're at this moment and with groups like um, Block Tower and um, all of the work that's going on inside of MakerDAO now around the end game and MetaDAOs, I'll hand it over to Assad um, to kind of transition into that part of the, uh, the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Lucas. Uh, so I, I think it's really important that, like, you know, at Centrifuge, just taking a step back, we, we've kind of always taken an approach that we like to build alongside our partners. Uh, and so when something like the end game comes out and initiative like this is taken, it's really important for us to be able to kind of really think about that on a fundamental level and how it impacts the protocol and what opportunities are there for the work that we're doing, right? You, you've heard the vision from Lucas, you've kind of seen what we're actually building on a deeper level from, from Colin. You know, so I think there's a question about like, what do MetaDAOs and the endgame mean for this, right? <clears throat> I think the answer very simply from our perspective is that MetaDAOs represent a really kind of critical structure to allow RWAs to scale within the maker protocol. You know, if I think about the challenges that real world assets have, and, and you know, we could talk about this for probably hours, but you know, to maybe sum it up very quickly, you know, there's, there's a decision-making complexity that's involved, right? To be able to understand what it takes to, you know, let's say even under identify a good deal to identify a deal that works for Maker alongside the Maker balance sheet, to be able to identify where the appropriate risks are, where the appropriate mitigation for those risks are in place, to just then managing real world assets over the long term, you know that that's an incredibly complex topic that I think is very difficult to to scale, right? And that that kind of is the next thing I think of as a challenge. You know, real world assets is such a you know it's a buzzword that really means so much, and we think about bringing the entire world of credit on chain. Uh, it, it's massive. You know, there's public debt. Like U.S. Treasuries, there's public debt like foreign government treasuries. There's public debt in the form of municipal bonds and corporate bonds, and, or uh, you know, uh, bonds from smaller countries and or you know, joint countries, right? Then you go to the world of private debt, which gets incredibly complicated. You talk about something like equities, or you talk about maybe derivatives or more exotic products, and trying to imagine how a DAO can really scale to be able to address all of those concerns, I think, is, is pretty massive, right? And then the last one that I think the community has talked about a lot over the last like couple of weeks, right, is that there is this regulatory and legal challenge when working with real world assets and when working on the frontier of, you know, financial innovation. Um, and I think that that can't be ignored. But but when I think about MetaDAOs and the, you know, go back to our, our perspective that we think this is a critical structure, you know, why do we think that this is useful in light of those things I said? Maybe it also I'll try to help answer Kianga's question in the Q&A. You know, I think the first is, is that we believe that you know metadows really are kind of a key structural organizational factor that to enable like a diverse economic impact you can kind of have this higher level business model you can have the framework of a metadow that's able to go and address and say i'm going to work within these kind of business constraints within these kind of debt constraints targeting these kind of instruments industries and this type of process with this type of meta this type of culture and i think that you know if we can prove within these first two protector DAOs that this model works we can really scale that up to almost an infinite degree right wherever kind of die can be used I think the end games addressing systematic resilience within the maker protocol is like super important, right? You know, we understand working with rural assets that there's a lot of things to consider. And for us, you know, we can't really build those kind of uh, like uh, mitigations within the, the context of the world that we're doing. You know, it's up to the maker protocol to really build kind of mitigations at a core fundamental level down at the protocol layer. And I think the end game really does address this in a very unique way, in a very, I think, like conceptual way that it really, really helps. Um, and I think having that kind of as a first class citizen in the protocol and be up there as a first class citizen on the strategy as well is, is really important to us. And then this final part, right? Um, and this is here trying to address Kianga's question. You know, when we at Centrifuge kind of think about the partners that we worked with, 
one of the reasons we worked with a stable coin like Maker was because of the core value kind of offerings that the, the characteristics are uh, of the of DAI, right? And what, what are those? That's being decentralized, it's being credibly neutral, and it's being permissionless. I think those three characteristics help a stable coin like DAI to be reliable and accessible. You know, and we'll talk a little bit later about what it means for a currency. And you know, really it is about those two principles, being reliable and being accessible. And so when we think about real-world assets, we wouldn't want to do anything that compromises the principles and the virtues that DAI has, especially not those core principles, right? So, you know, to us, MetaDAOs enable this opportunity to really embed regulatory compliance at a level above the protocol. You know, a MetaDAO can take on the compliance and regulatory concerns in a way that Maker just can't today. And I think that really helps create a, a more kind of conducive approach to actually going out into the real world and addressing these legal and regulatory concerns. Um, you know, maybe to make this more real, right? I, you know, I invite Kevin Chan, who's from Block Tower. They've been spending a lot of time looking at this. You know, maybe Kevin can share a little bit of how this actually looks at a deeper level. Yeah. For sure. And before I kind of go into what this will look like and um, kind of talk about the Ranger model a little bit more in the MetaDAO, first, I wanted to start by saying, you know, I didn't drop out of school. I didn't join Block Tower Credit recently as a VP to um, really not make an impact. And what we have ahead of us is this opportunity to make an enormous impact by bringing, uh, by bridging the gap between real world assets and DeFi. Block Tower Credit is incredibly excited to partner with Centrifuge on bringing this, uh, making this a reality. And we've been, you know, followers and supporters of Centrifuge and TickLink for a long time. We're aligned on how on-chain securitization can really help shape the future. If you follow along on the forums, um, as well as our MIP6, you know that we're also longtime supporters of the Maker community, uh, you know, via Endgame and Maker now and into the future. So what an arranger is in answering the question that Tim had brought up is, you know, what what an, what what does it mean to be a ranger and why do we aim to be a top ranger of RWA? As Assad has mentioned, uh, real world assets are complex with legal structures and financial deal terms that need to be uh, structured in a manner that best aligns with the interests of the maker community as well as all parties involved. So an arranger is really a critical role in bridging that gap between uh, the DeFi community that we have here and uh, the endless opportunities of impact uh, through real world assets that are available um, in, in the world today. And again, Block Tower Credit aims to be um, one of the top arrangers uh, serving the maker community through Centrifuge that does that. And what that means is starting with uh, extremely positive meta. That meta, if we were to break it down, is a high degree of alignment. We're highly aligned on bringing high quality, again, impactful assets to the maker community. And we'll do so with tighter feedback loops. We'll have the most uh, you know, experienced individuals discussing and protecting both makers' interests and also arranging the deals so that it's at most uh, advantageous to all parties involved. This is all to help, again, navigate that complex landscape that Assad had mentioned associated with real world assets. We also wanna do so in a scalable manner. We're not focused on just driving the next deal forward. We wanna build a model and succeed alongside Maker and Centrifuge. That's why um, we're so involved and so integrated with Centrifuge because we want to build this platform that can enable uh, what we're doing at scale. Um, and what we're doing is, again, bringing that professional experience that we've accumulated from years of, ex years of experience in traditional finance um, institutions and bring those best practices to Maker to arrange the best deals, leverage our network to identify and source those impactful opportunities, and using our experience to structure and leverage trust structures that, like for example, Colin had mentioned, to both protect us from a legal structural standpoint, um, as well as make sure that compliance is uh, met. Um, and this is all done with the goal and eye of principle preservation. This is the key core piece of making sure that we succeed. We, we only succeed uh, if Maker succeeds. And that's done by, again, leveraging the power of Centrifuge's Tin Lake platform, which does a big part of this, but also the tight alignment and feedback um, and close collaboration between Maker, Centrifuge, and Block Tower and other rangers that will make this a possibility. Um, you know, we're incredibly excited for um, to be working on this um, and engaging in this journey with the community. Uh, this is a small piece of what this would look like. More updates will come. 
um, in the following weeks, months. So we're excited to share that. Um, but hopefully this is a good preview. I'll turn it back to Asad to talk a little bit more about the impact of what we're doing here. Yeah, I, I maybe just to like wrap us up and kind of take us to the close. There's a lot of good questions. So I think getting to the Q&A is pretty important. Uh, you know, you've heard kind of our like fundamental belief, right? And our vision, we're trying to bring the entire world of credit on chain. Uh, we think partners like MakerDAO are really critical to doing that. Uh, Lucas talked about the opportunity that RWAs offer from both a stability and a volume perspective. Uh, Colin talked about what we're really building and our focus, you know, we're really trying to be an on-chain protocol that can support a decentralized ecosystem of real world assets throughout the value chain. Um, and then I think maybe like, you know, the, and then the end game, right? It, it, you know, we believe it's a critical structure, we're partnering alongside Block Tower to try to bring that reality to life. We think there's a huge opportunity there. Um, you know, maybe to just like kind of bring the reiterate the point, right? <clears throat> and this, you know, I think is applicable to DAI, but I think it's applicable to DeFi as a whole, right? If we think about how do we actually bring DAI to the real world, right? There's tons of regulatory risk, there's tons of existential risk with something like real world assets, tons of technical challenges, there's tons of adoption challenges. Um, I'm going to borrow a framework from you know international political economy. Uh, there's these two books I've written on the uh, I've listed on the right there. Uh, you have currency power and the politics of international currencies. And I think it's a useful framework to just kind of think about how this could actually occur, right? <clears throat> there's this idea of the currency pyramid. Uh, at the bottom of the currency pyramid, you have niche currencies. And there's a lot of niche currencies that are out there. You can probably name a few yourself. And I think DAI kind of squarely falls into that, that portion of the pyramid today, right? At the top of the pyramid, you have the US dollar, the global reserve currency, and really like, the, you know, I think we all understand why and when, what that means and kind of the implications of that. And if we think about, I think the next key question is how does DAI actually start climbing the currency pyramid, right? The next level is known what's known as a managed currency. I think it's also to note that it's known as a political currency and a negotiated currency. And the answer is actually quite simple. It's not about power or power projection. You know, on an international level, you really can't take your army and go and force rules across the borders unless you're maybe the biggest country in the world, right? So how do you grow from a niche currency to this slightly something slightly bigger? And the answer is quite simple. It's you know offering mutual economic benefit. If people can look at DAI and sense an opportunity to gain access to economic opportunity, and then sense an opportunity to bring DAI in to gain access to economic growth, then DAI itself becomes more palatable, more acceptable, more usable from a political perspective. You know, and I think this is quite simple. Everybody understands it. The more DAI is usable, the more DAI is kind of let's say uh, acceptable and scalable. But you know, I think adding this framework is really kind of a useful perspective. And really what it's saying to me is that, you know, the path to political acceptance of DAI is a path to economic acceptance. And so real world assets are just one kind of channel that DAI can really focus on to do that. I, we think it's a great channel at Centrifuge, but, you know, it's it's one of the many key pieces that we believe that is necessary for DAI to kind of get to the next level. <clears throat> um, and just to bring us to the Q&A, you know, nothing can be more complex than the, the MakerDAO smart contract architecture. So I think showing this on screen and then asking, uh, is everything clear about what we said today? Is this is useful? So um, I've listed our Discord names and our forum handles there on the right. Uh, but yeah, I think opening up the floor for discussion sounds like a great idea. Great. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, get it kicked off by saying uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, it's a very thorough update and I think very timely as well with uh, everything that is going on in the DAO. Um, addressing the uh, question with the uh, number one most uh, voted um, uh, interest uh, in the side bar um, on the theme of the day as well, uh, the, the audience asked the, the risks of real world assets seems far greater than decentralized collateral. So why would Maker engage with assets that can be taken away? Uh, Colin, I saw that you typed up a, a couple of thoughts there, but if you want to elaborate on that for the, the video. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. I can jump in. So I, I, I think that the risks are uh, abundantly clear, right? Especially in light of what's going on with Tornado Cash, everything that happened with Luna. Um, it's, it's, it's a very pertinent question um, and, in, and a very easy question to ask, which I think is top of mind. Um, what I referenced in my answer is, um, I don't really know if it's Centrifuge's question to answer, to be honest, right? Like I actually look back to the maker community and what the future of DAI looks like when I think about that question. Undoubtedly, there's risks, but um, the question ignores like what the rewards could be. And I think Assad narrated it quite well when you think about what a top currency could look like and what that looks like and what the, the vision of MakerDAO holds. Um, 
and what they what the community once died to become, that's the reward. Um, and I and I think there's a path towards that top currency path uh, that Assad's narrated. Um, but I, I I think we would have to, or maybe the maker community should be looking at what the risks are in the short term um, versus what the rewards are uh, in, in the long term from a from a market opportunity perspective. Yeah. Maybe Colin, can I just jump in for a second? Yeah. 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 Well, so this is Eli Cohen. I'm general counsel at Centrifuge, and this is obviously something that 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 the lawyers look at really closely in terms of any RWA deal, but in terms of any deals, any kind of transactions anywhere. I've got about 20 years of experience in both crypto and trad by markets. And I, I think actually the focus of the community is a little bit backwards on this. So I know there's been a lot of discussion in the community. I've seen it a lot in the forums about the risk of seizure of real world assets. I, you know, I don't think that's a real serious risk. You know, the trust assets, assets held in a Delaware statutory trust to be seized by an authority, they, they, it would have to be a, a huge step for them. It's it, it Because it doesn't just affect the DeFi markets, it affects all of the TradFi markets. Tens of thousands of securitizations are based on the Delaware statutory trust structure, trust indenture structure. It would call into question a whole lot of the TradFi markets to just seize assets like this that are held in a securitized vehicle. So it's it's not a step that any kind of authorities are going to take lightly. Um, whether the U.S. authorities even have power to do that is another question. Um, and I don't think that's all that clear. I mean, we do in this country, in the United States, have uh, contract law, and contract law is enforceable. So we don't really think that assets held in a trust are going to be easily seized by any authority. And I think it's also backwards because in the decentralized assets that, we're, that the community talks about can also be seized very easily. In fact, probably more easily than any kind of trust structure held assets. Uh, you know, we've seen wallets be put on the sanction list. We've seen plenty of uh, crypto assets seized by authorities, not just in the U.S., but across the globe. So to, 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 to think that decentralized assets can't be seized and real world assets can be seized, to me, seems kind of backwards. I also think there's a bit of too much focus on the community on the how and not enough on the why. So the community talks a lot about how authorities might seize assets or take assets away from maker, but never about why. So the important thing is that the authorities are not going to do this for no reason. They're going to do it because they think that maker's been working with bad actors. Well, I think the RWA markets is a way to protect maker against working with bad actors because all of the investors in the RWA markets go through a KYC process, do a sanctions check process. So there isn't a chance for, for RWA assets to be held um, by bad actors, or there should not be. And so if to the extent that makers placing their trust in, in real world assets means that they're less likely to be interacting with bad actors, whereas in the decentralized markets, they'd be more likely to be interacting with bad actors. So to me, I think the focus is a little bit off in the community and it's something that, you know, maybe maybe the lawyers, Kianga, and other of the lawyers in the community can also speak to. Yeah, and it, it is a complicated uh, topic. Definitely. And uh, people who maybe haven't spent as much time in, in law and finance as the team here today has uh, are, are just being introduced to some of these concepts. So it, it is important to uh, have that perspective uh, reset and, and uh, taking the bigger picture. But also on the bigger picture, uh, one of our delegates, Code Knight, asks, how does this compare to the current on-chain credit providers like TrueFi, Maple and Go Goldfinch, uh, as an example? I'm happy to take a stab at it, Colin and Lucas, if you guys want to jump in, just feel free. Uh, you, you know, I think that on one hand, I think all of the real world asset service providers are kind of all offering different things and different focuses today. I mentioned how big of a market this really is. And so if you look at something like Goldfinch, which is really focused on like emerging markets, uh, Maple is really been focused kind of on, let's say like crypto capital markets and crypto capital providers. And then TrueFi kind of a similar approach as well. And also kind of offering maybe a different UX and, and a different perspective from that angle. Uh, I think Centrifuge has really been focused on really like kind of the core, like the total value chain. And for us, that really starts with tokenizing the asset on chain, bringing it on board as an NFT, and then creating like through Tinlake, these securitization pool structures that allow kind of financing the flow in and these subordinate tranching 
uh, structures. So that's kind of the way I divide it in my head, but um, I'd love to get maybe Lucas or Colin to, to share their perspective. I'd love to hear from, from Eli. I, I mean, I can say, right, like, but one of the things we focus on is secured loans. So there's actually collateral backing uh, these loans, right? Now, I will not, but like, not uh, butcher the explanation that probably Eli is going to give much more eloquently, but the key point is there that like our assets are backed by like collateral and maybe you want to share that this like what this actually means. Yeah, I mean what I mean what that means when you when you're investing into a trust when you have an interest in a trust that means that first there there are assets underlying the trust there are assets held in the trust and that your recourse is not to any individual issuer but in fact to the assets themselves. So unlike dealing with uh, you know, uh, a U.S. Treasury where you have the full recourse of the U.S. government behind it. Uh, here, the recourse is to physical assets, so real estate or uh, trade receivables or other kinds of assets that are not financial assets necessarily, but real world assets. So I think this is, I think, in quite something that the community needs to think about is the diversification. I think in order, and also to go back a little bit to Kianga's question, the way to build resilience into the collateral, into the collateral that is backing the die is by diversification. So the more that the community can diversify the types of assets, the types of collateral used to, to back the die, the more chance that it's going to be resilient. So resilience is based on diversification. And as Asad mentioned, real world assets are a huge huge market and there's a huge range of different possible assets, everything from solar projects to, to trade receivables to mortgages. So it's it's a way that you can build some real diversification into the collateral backing the die. Yeah, and I think that's a perfect segue. I do see that uh, some of the questions are being responded to in text, but just to make sure that we're able to capture it for our uh, audience on YouTube. Uh, Colin, would you like to uh, talk through uh, some uh, some of those expanding opportunities into uh, green focus projects like solar and battery facilities. Yeah, sure. So, so, so I think it's a good question, right? Which is kind of like green assets or solar projects. I think there's probably a difference between um, some of the solar projects that I think have come across the maker form through various MIPS um, versus, uh, and what I referenced in my response is that there's actually a group um, named Flow Carbon that's presenting uh, tomorrow uh, through centrifuge to talk a little bit about carbon credits um, and what the vision they hold uh, for the future of green assets on chain. Um, I, I think the the other piece of the answer to my the answer I provided was simply that uh, at a project level, I think how a, an energy project gets financed is a bit outside of my my, my scope of expertise at an individual level. Um, but that I'm uh, I'm sure those projects will have a home on chain in the future. How and what that looks like, I'm not sure. Um, but was really referencing that from a, a, uh, at the asset level, right, or asset-backed securitizations, which is kind of what we're focused on here at Centrifuge. Um, those projects are already underway, uh, and Flow Carbon, which I referenced in the comment, uh, is a good example, and they can narrate that story uh, far better than I can. Perfect. And then, uh, again, to touch on another question that was answered in the uh, chat, uh, going over to Assad, uh, Raphael asks for clarification on how the counterparty for maker MetaDAOs uh, would be structured, whether that's Centrifuge or uh, Block Tower or some other structure. Yeah, actually, I'm going to ask uh, Kevin to provide his perspective, um, and I'll, I'll share just maybe like a quick note is that, uh, you know, the really the like spirit of the MetaDAOs today are really about clustering, and you know, that's kind of a broad term. But today, what that really means is bringing together a group of people that are willing to work together on kind of taking on this initiative in the first place. And so in this case, you know, Centrifuge wouldn't be the exact counterparty working with Make the DAO. It'd be more of like an ecosystem actor or a service provider providing kind of that on-chain tokenization structure. Um, and you know, I, I think Block Tower is the right answer there. And of course, there's going to be like a, a kind of a maker representative on, on that side as well, um, like a facilitator and a core team. But uh, I think I'll turn it over to Kevin and allow him to provide his perspective. Yeah, I think the the only thing I would clarify is uh, there won't be you know a single like as Block Tower as the arranger will, will be one of um, maybe a couple of counterparties. There's also, for example, as Eli mentioned, the trust structure that uh, you can view as a counterparty that you know acts on behalf of Maker and and the drop in tin token holders, which we would be um, a counterparty to as well. So there there are multiple players in this in this um, you know landscape, which is why. 
the meta DAO and tight feedback loop con construct works so well. But uh, to answer your question straight, Block Tower will obviously be involved uh, as a counterparty, as an arranger to help um, structure deals, um, ensure incentives are aligned, uh, incentives are aligned um, and work with Centrifuge to onboard assets uh, to make it. Perfect. Appreciate that, uh, that extra detail added. Um, going through the questions here, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we have another one about uh, diversification asking, uh, what is the Centrifuge team's view on implementing potentially another stable coin that could, uh, could be used for Tin Lake uh, or uh, Centrifuge pools? Once. Uh, token is potentially launched. I, I think it's hard to say yet. Um, Maker is by far the largest decentralized stable coin that we can kind of use to, that, that can be used to back, or can be backed by real world assets. I mean, of course, like we're looking at Aave and others as well for, for, um, for a place to kind of where, where our users of Centrifuge can borrow. Right. It would be kind of like it's obviously in, in everyone's best interest that that these borrowers get get the best rates possible. And, and that's that's kind of like how we're looking at it. Um, ultimately, though, I think, right, like this is this is, again, like a place where probably the maker community has a huge, huge uh, leg up right now on real world assets. And, and I think in this in the DeFi space, as, as I saw it, um, and then I like started out, the real world assets is the hottest thing, but um, I think there's there's probably like a quite a bit of, of um, work already done in the maker community that few few other protocols have have managed to do so far. And that's really, I think, I mean, also a testament to the OG nature of maker, I think that um, like it, from actually the very beginning, like like 2016, um, maker team or whatever founding team members uh, were talking about what it would mean to actually extend credit to real businesses and how to how to do that and I think that was like very much in in the DNA of, of kind of those like the early um, the early team and I think that's that is why like right today 30 million of our TVL is coming from maker roughly um, and and I probably expect that to scale quite a bit. No, again, uh, appreciate that perspective and a bit of history. Um, competition is a good thing, but um, as always, uh, uh, I think that really helps the space uh, evolve uh, it, together is the main focus there. Um, we'll go ahead and end it on this last question here. I think it's a good one to uh, kind of wrap up our discussion today. Uh, Marcus asks, what do you believe is the biggest bottleneck for onboarding real world assets uh, on chain? Maybe we can all provide a perspective. I think there's probably a lot that we could speak on to this. Hey, who doesn't have an answer to that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll share mine real quick. You know, I think that uh, the biggest challenge is really a sense of maturity. I think, you know, there's it's a complex topic, real world assets. I thought Eli provided a great kind of perspective that we don't really hear a lot of that, about you know, where the risks really are and how to really view the risk and manage them, mitigate them. And so I think, you know, where that maturity is built, I think, is in the community. I think it's like during calls like this, questions like this, and taking the time to really listen and ask people hard, hard questions. And so, to me, I think that's a, the biggest sticking point today. But I also feel like we're actively working on it. Eli, you got to be yeah. Maybe. I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a, a legal perspective. Sure. So, you know, I think for you know the challenge that we've been having since uh, I worked with Christian on the on the indenture arrangements. You know, we started working on that back in January, and we, you know, we've been working steadily on it pretty much ever since. the The real challenge, I think, has been actually on the tradfi side, the the trust indenture structure, the Delaware statutory trust structure requires the involvement of tradfi players like a trustee, and to convince them uh, that what is going on in the DeFi markets and what's going on in the crypto space is is safe or is uh, it doesn't add additional risks to them, isn't too volatile. I mean, that's been the real challenge, I think, for 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 the on the legal side is not 
so much convincing the DeFi community that RWA assets are good, but convincing the TradFi community that they should be involved in the DeFi markets in the first place. Yeah, I, I will comment that um, on the debt issuer side, that generally not a bottleneck. People always want lower cost of borrowing and be able to, you know, they wouldn't take a loan that uh, goes at a higher rate. So, you know, on, on that side, uh, we've seen a lot of great traction on the uh, debt issuers who are, you know, very, they, very, very interested in, in um, this whole on-chain securitization concept and, um, um, you know, ready to go, just like we are. So that's just call it there. <laughs> I'll pick you back on, Kevin answer, on Kevin's answer. I think, um, you know, if you just go back to like what the past three years have been between Maker and Centrifuge, it's been like infrastructure proof of concept. And now the tipping point, right, is I, I think expanding capital markets on behalf of issuers like Block Tower, right? And in this bear market, I think RWAs have come to the forefront of a lot of people's attention. Uh, they're obviously at the forefront of the conversation inside the maker community. Um, but where I think we stand now, at least on chain and thinking about like on chain lenders, um, is one, it's, it's, it's not a very deep bench. Um, and then I think two, um, is really getting to some type of consensus or baseline understanding across DeFi, um, around how to invest in, uh, RWAs in a safe and scalable way. Uh, and that's part of what today's presentation and conversation is about. So Lucas, I guess you got the final word. No, I think we've, we've already discussed this or mentioned most of it. No, I think it's just. It, ultimately, we're combining like the real world and code and crypto, and that's just right now the problem space is twice as twice as big, but it's also twice as exciting. So I think that's what we're. That's why, despite all these hurdles, I think we're gonna make a really cool, um, have really good impact, and make some cool stuff with with uh, kind of this endless journey of improving and scaling real world assets with Maker. No, I have to completely agree with you there, Lucas. Uh, I think the presentation speaks for itself. Uh, it really captures a lot of uh, hard work uh, as well as sets the scene for uh, the future of real world assets on chain. So I'd like to thank everybody again for uh, joining uh, both in the audience and especially to the uh, centrifuge team here for showing up in force. Uh, we're always uh, uh, welcome to host you guys. Uh, if the community is looking for some more information, uh, there is a uh, forum tag at forum.makerdow.com where you can explore all the topics that we talked about today uh, and uh, going to the MakerDAO YouTube uh, and looking in the focus on section, there is a couple of uh, previous uh, sessions that we hosted to uh, catch you up with the, uh, the project. So uh, again, thank you everyone. Uh, stay tuned to the forums for the, the latest news. And uh, we look forward to see the work that Centrifuge is doing and uh, appreciate the uh, support that you give our ecosystem. So have a great day, everyone. See you everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.